I'm Paul Robinson, a compiler engineer for Sony PlayStation. I work on the CPU compiler for the PlayStation 4, which is Clang. Hi, I'm Mike Edwards. Uh, I work with Paul. I'm a DevOps engineer. Um, I deal with the uh, build and test infrastructure that Paul uses and all of our compiler engineers use to make things great. So um, this is a kind of a hybrid uh, talk, Boff. So our plan is we'll, we'll talk for however long the slides last. We'll try, try to keep it well under half an hour and then give you all guys a chance to say whatever's on your mind. Um, I have spent uh, way more time than anybody should have to over the past four years, my entire lifetime at Sony, dealing with merges from upstream. Um, I have uh, put the upstream, did anybody need the upstream downstream metaphor explained? I've run into people who have not heard what that is. Okay, um, I do wanna make a distinction between a local patch which is something you have done in your copy of the source with a private patch, which is something you have done in your local copy of the source that you never intend to send upstream. Okay, these are different classes of patches, um, so they might require different tactics. Uh, just so you understand what the flood is about, uh, we did some, some uh, diagnostics on the commits, for the calendar year 2014. I came up with LLVM and Clang, which is the part that Sony cares most about. Um, ran just over 50 commits per day, 365 days a year as the average. Um, if you care about compiler RT, uh, tools extra, all that other stuff, um, which we are starting to, um, you're talking about another 20 or so commits per day. Um, Raphael has started working on LLD, so I think that number will go up. <laughs> Just a little history of where we're coming from. Um, we've, uh, first two or three years worth of working on Clang and LLVM. Um, our project was a big, deep, dark secret, and so nothing that we did could be even mentioned upstream. We hardly even admitted we were working on LLVM at all. Um, <clears throat> Some of the bits we did, um, at the time we started, we had picked an x86-64 chip to work on, um, but not all of the subsets of our chip had been implemented upstream, so we implemented a bunch of them ourselves. Um, then other people came along and implemented them upstream, and so we got to throw away all kinds of stuff. Um, I, should, I should be looking at this one. Um, uh, we've, done, uh, we've done a bunch of stuff. It's not worth going through all of it. Um, uh, I, I want to point out specifically the driver, which will be an example for uh, later. Um, we had our own version of the driver because we have our own tool chain. But we did that two different ways. Um, there we go. Uh, just to give you some volume numbers, um, so we've, we've had a bunch of local changes. Um, I divided this up. The blue stuff is um, changes to the code of LVM and Clang, um, which was running in the uh, seven to 8,000 line range up until about a year ago, and we started seriously uh, moving our patches upstream. Um, so the blue, the blue column now as of uh, LLVM 3.7, we're down to about 4,500 lines. Uh, the red part is the tests. I have no explanation whatsoever for the big jump in 3.6. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but it went away, so I'm okay with it. <clears throat> and then we have a whole pile of new tests. Uh, that number hasn't been going down either, and I think that's because we forgot to delete our local copies of the tests that we sent upstream. <laughs> uh, we don't have any procedure for that. Uh, so the trend actually is in the right direction. We're going down, so that reduces our merge pain because we have fewer local changes. So as I said, four years ago I started at Sony. Um, I had previously spent the, uh, some time at Palm where I was doing some work with JavaScript, um, adopting the, uh, we, we were using the V8 
JavaScript compiler and we were pulling stuff from Google every week and my boss said, hey, you know about this upstream merge stuff, why don't you do our next upstream merge from LLVM? Which was going from 2.9 to 3.0. Uh, I went back and looked, it was eight months of work between uh, the release of 2.9 and the release of 3.0. Uh, it took me three months to get past all of the physical conflicts, which is the easy part, um, and then getting all the tests to pass again. This was uh, three months to, to catch up with eight months worth of work. This is not a super efficient way to, to run your project. Um, I did invent one clever thing. Uh, maybe some people are used to the idea of a three-way merge. I, I, I have a four-way merge. <laughs> so you, sometimes you want to compare the upstream old version to the upstream new version to see what happened to the public source so we can make sure the same thing happened if you compare our old version to our new version. Um, but sometimes it's more convenient to compare the upstream old version to our old version to see what we did and make sure that an equivalent thing happened uh, in the upstream new to our new. So you, you do really need four trees uh, to do a proper code review and in fact we had a policy of Everything that I did by hand had to be code reviewed, <laughs> which took several weeks all by itself. So I went back to my boss and said, this, this is no good. <laughs> we, can't, we can't work this way. We need to pull more often than once every release if we're going to do this. So we started pulling every couple of months. Um, so it still took about a month of work to get all of that done. So. Uh, that wasn't really an improvement. <laughs> we were more current with upstream, but it was still costing as much as it ever did. Um, so we decided we need to have better tactics. Uh, so we, we uh, settled on two things. One is we would uh, create better patch tactics. So how do, we, what do, how do we make our local changes in ways that are not as painful to merge? And then, um, in the long run, how, do, how can we automate what we're doing so that there's, it's less tedious and, and therefore less human cost involved in the automation? Uh, in order to talk about patch tactics, I need to distinguish between development mode and maintenance mode. Development mode is what upstream does. I mean, you, you're considering the long-term health of the project. You are always looking forward, never looking back. Um, you are willing to rewrite the pass manager. <laughs> you are willing to re-implement how debug info metadata works to do the valuable task of making the memory consumption of debug info during LTO something that you can tolerate. Uh, these are all great things that people can do upstream. These are not things that you can do privately. Um, textual consistency of the source doesn't matter because you are always looking forward. Clang format is de rigueur now. A re um, gratuitous churn is considered unfriendly, but still people get away with it. Maintenance mode. Uh, when I started in industry all these many years ago, uh, we had two independent organizations working on our software. We had the developing group, which did the new features and put out the new releases and kept the customers happy by implementing new things, supporting new hardware, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we had the maintenance team, uh, which in different companies goes under different names, but it's all the same thing. And they took the bug reports and made the fixes and kept the customers happy by fixing their problems. Uh, this, is, this is fun because the developers look down on the maintainers who can't implement a new feature to save their lives. Sorry, who can't develop a new feature to save their lives. And the maintainers look down on the developers who can't implement a new feature correctly to save their lives. But as part of this process, I, I, I learned that in maintenance mode, you do the minimum change necessary. You don't see this happen very much in LVM. Nobody cares about how small your patch is. Right. They want to know how correct your patch is, how good your patch is, whether it is a 
wonderful engineering solution to the problem. Sometimes the wonderful engineering solution to the problem is in fact very small, just by chance. <laughs> right? And when that happens, then you can put it into the patch release. But you don't purposely put patches into the patch release. It's just the things that you happen to get right. So if you have long-term local changes, whether they're private changes or things you intend to send upstream eventually, um, maintenance mode is your friend. You want to minimize the textual scope of your changes so that you will minimize the likelihood that some upstream change will cause you a conflict. Um, you might create a subclass for your special behavior. This is a mistake that we made with the driver, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, we had started out by just hacking an existing driver subclass. Um, and so we, every time somebody changed that particular original driver subclass upstream, we had all kinds of conflicts. And so eventually we learned better. We just threw away the old changes. We cloned this subclass. We made our own private version. This caused our internal line count to go way up, but it's because it was all completely new code, we never had any merge conflicts anymore, so we win. Sometimes having a bigger local change is actually better. And, ah, local, uh, where am I? Local tests in new files. If you have a new file, it doesn't exist upstream. If it doesn't exist upstream, nobody can muck it up on you, right? Sometimes the test has to, sometimes you have to change a local test, uh, change an upstream test to match with your local behavior. Yeah, you have to live with that. Anything that's new behavior that you're implementing, a new test, you keep it local. Local change made here comments. This is a tactic that I was introduced to at Palm, and, but was kind of a hard sell um, because it made our local patches bigger and was a pain to remember to do. Um, but um, if you have comments in your local changes that say, this is a, a local change that we made on purpose, then when you see the diff, you have a comment right in front of you that says, this is a local change we made on purpose. And that means that you can resolve the conflict in 10, ten seconds instead of half an hour and every time that happens, I win. So here's an example. Um, if, you, if there's a range of code, uh, we have bracketed SCE for Sony Computer Entertainment. Just um, We have a bug reference so that if you need to know why this is there, you can go find out. Um, and then we have a shortcut for a one-liner. Uh, yeah, not too long ago, somebody decided that Triples were bad and tuples were the thing. And so, change the header names. Uh, but, oh, this extra line. Well, that's one of ours, and so I can keep that. I can solve this conflict in 30 seconds instead of 10 minutes. I win. All right. So, uh, somebody on my team did delete a lump of upstream code that we didn't care about once. <laughs> yeah, you don't do that. We never, we never use Clang format because it causes, it causes unnecessary textual changes. Anybody else doing the same thing upstream will cause a conflict. We don't like, we don't like conflict. We're, we're peace-loving peoples. We don't like conflicts. Don't put your new test at the end of an existing test file because the next time somebody upstream comes along to add something to the test, where will they put it? At the end of the test file. What happens when you bring that change into your local pat, to your local tree? It causes a conflict. Yes, very good. You, you get it, yes. <laughs> so, and what's the answer? Do it upstream first. Um, yeah, so. We spent years not doing it upstream first because we weren't allowed to. Um, we're doing a whole lot better at that now. Uh, so when you, tr but <laughs> it's no fun taking a local change that you did in maintenance mode and trying to put it upstream in uh, in development mode. Um, I've I, I have 
one of the champion. I, I'm, a, I'm a strong contender for, for the longest term outstanding code review <laughs> uh, on, on a, I, th I think, second or third, uh, putting some of our changes upstream, going through many rounds of review. No, it shouldn't be done that way. Uh, one of my coworkers uh, had to re-implement her patch four, patch it, was it three times or four times? Three times, yeah. Three different ways, twice in LLVM and twice in Clang, because Blakey couldn't make up his mind. Uh, but this is, this is what happens. I mean, you go through these iterations, and the thing is that in the end, you do have a better engineered, more solid upstream product. So as, as, as much as I hate doing the long, drawn-out iterations of design and rework, there's value to it, and I can't say it was a, it's a bad thing. Okay, and now it's Mike's turn. Paul. Okay, so we needed a lifeboat, right? And for us, that was gonna happen in the form of automation. By implementing things like continuous integration and a phase building approach, we were able to get uh, a working handle on the constant flow of commits that were coming at us from upstream. Now, automation helps us to be effective at merging commits and building and testing new code, and through a nice, healthy investment in infrastructure, we can do all of that very, very quickly. So what does navigating the stream look like for us? How do we do it? Well, first thing we have to do is actually get in the boat, right? Um, and for us, that was when we began the process of integrating upstream work uh, with our internal patches, and we didn't actually employ any automation at that point. Um, and so by working through the process manually, we were able to actually pinpoint exactly what automation would work best for us when we were actually ready to deploy it. At some point, we get around to actually trying to get the motor started. Uh, and that's when we noticed this volume of commits that were occurring upstream. Paul mentions it as a tsunami, and that's really what it looked like. It was a little overwhelming. So we try to automate things that we think are worth automating at that point. And we apply the automation quickly, but we do it in a controlled way so that we make sure we avoid any unintended consequences. And being human beings, a little bit of panic always sets in, right? This was where we realized that we were going to actually have to keep engineers employed in the process of dealing with merge conflicts. Paul calls it merge pain, right? He calls that dealing with merge pain. Merge pain is the pain that actually gets inflicted upon Paul and the other guys that work with him when they have to go through hours of diffs to figure out how to make the commits actually merge onto our private branches. Eventually, we get the motor started. We finally get underway. Uh, that's where we actually start to employ continuous integration. Uh, an example of this is we have a bot that attempts to merge uh, things from upstream with a private branch, and if it's not clean, it'll actually file tickets for us and notify us. All of this is to really get us headed upstream, right? And for us, the ultimate goal is to be able to get to a place where integration happens on a consistent, reliable basis with the minimal amount of human intervention. So what does our continuous integration workflow look like? Well, we start with commits to LLVM.org on the master branch, and we bring those down and automatically try to merge those after a quick build and test, sort of a sanity check. We try to merge those onto a branch we have called open source. And the open source branch is uh, where we have a merged tree of LLVM, Clang, Compiler RT, and LLD. Once we get things onto the open source branch, we immediately try to do an automated merge against our staging branch. And this allows us to know whether the merge is gonna be clean or whether we're gonna have a merge conflict to deal with. Now, if it's clean, it's great, because a human being can come along behind and just commit the merge quickly. But more often than not, we end up having a merge conflict that we have to deal with, and so a little bit of human intervention is actually uh, required there. We also have to deal with our private patches, and those occur on our master branch. Um, and we, do, we, we deal with those by cherry picking those up to our staging branch. We don't want to have this like weird two-way merge thing going on, so cherry picking allows us to just bring things up, get our staging branch consistent, and then eventually we can take all of that work and merge it back down to master, thus getting master as close back to LLVM.org master as possible. 
the end goal of all of this is to try and reduce the iteration time so that eventually we can automate as much of this as possible, but it is a work in progress. So as I mentioned, we're still doing a whole bunch of manual bulk merging, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, so the gorilla is Paul. Uh, because we have to have somebody that watches over these branches and make sure that um, an incorrect merge doesn't cause a whole bunch of heartache for a whole bunch of people. Um, so Paul does a really good job of, of protecting the branches from the rest of us and from, from any mistakes that, that we make. Uh, our open source branch currently is the only branch we have that is 100% automated. Uh, Bot takes care of it. Uh, and Paul is adamant about making sure that uh, no human being actually touches that branch so that uh, it doesn't get out of sync and, and our bot can continue to just do its work because it's reliable and it works well. Um, okay, something I am very excited about uh, and I wanted to show off a little bit. Um, we were fortunate enough uh, this last year to be able to actually commit a really nice piece of hardware to the community. And uh, with that, we actually stood up our first public bot, uh, and that's it. Um, this bot builds our triple. Uh, it acts as a really nice first line of defense against new commits, branking, LLVM, Clang, or LLD, uh, and, and of course our triple. Uh, it runs on Ubuntu, it's nice and fast. Uh, an average typical build is around three minutes. Uh, tests take an additional 16 seconds to run. So, um, you know, it's great. If you have a new commit and you throw it up there, you can jump over to LLVM, uh, lab.llvm.org uh, and you can find our bot and very quickly you can know whether your commit is causing any issues or not. Um, we also are uh, working hard to try and get a Windows version of this bot up and running as well so that we can increase our, our coverage a bit. Okay, so internally we use a four-phase building approach on our open source branches. Uh, we also build on Linux, Mac, and Windows hardware um, so that we can maximize the coverage that we have for new commits coming in. So when a new commit comes in from upstream, we start with phase one. Phase one's our fast builder. It's a release only. It's a dirty build. Targets x86, runs in about 27 seconds. Gives us a really, really nice sanity check to know whether um, this commit is worth spending any other time on any of our other bots or just moving on to the next thing. Uh, if, it, if it works and it succeeds, we move on to phase two. Uh, phase two is just a little bit more complex. We turn on assertions, we turn on tests, we, do the, we run the tests, um, we use a clean object directory. It takes about six minutes. All right. Um, all we're missing is a mirror ball. Okay, uh, phase three, uh, debug build, uh, runs around eight minutes. Um, and if everything works well on phase three, we progress on to phase four. Phase four is exactly the same as phase three. Uh, the only difference is instead of just targeting x86, we target all the things. Uh, um, it takes about nine and a half minutes. So the really cool thing about all that is a new commit comes in from upstream. It can work its way all the way through our phase build approach in around 25 minutes. And when you stop to consider that on average, a new commit is coming into upstream around every 30 minutes, it means that we can build almost every commit individually. So it's great for troubleshooting, right? It allows us to pinpoint a committer if there's a failure somewhere. We can easily go grab some logs. We can get them out to people. It just makes it really, really helpful for everybody that's involved. Um, oh, and on our uh, private branches, we do the exact same thing, except we just do a three-phase build approach. We emit phase four because we only need it, uh, x86. So what does our build pipeline look like? Uh, so we start with the commit, uh, do some builds and tests, and we end up with an asset. So assets can be one of two types. We either have a passing asset or a failing asset. Failing assets we can discard really quickly. They, it's just a little bit of log information. We send a notification. The loop goes back to just waiting for another commit to come through. Passing assets are pretty cool, right? So a passing asset is a built compiler and the uh, supporting files that it needs to be able to do its work. And we archive that. Uh, we use a Git repository where we actually archive the uh, binaries. Uh, we use Git because it's simple. Uh, it was easy for us to implement. Um, and it was a ready-to-go solution. It made standing up that uh, phase or that part of the pipeline very easy. 
Git's also great uh, because it allows us to search for that asset later on down the road if we need to go find it quickly. It gives us a, a very quick means of, of doing that. Once we archive it, we actually publish it via an internal API. Um, publishing it allows us to make the asset available to other automated processes or uh, internal teams or clients that may need um, that built compiler to be able to do whatever it is that they need to do. Uh, after that, we just trigger any other processes that, that might be waiting uh, in the pipeline, um, and we go back to just waiting to run the whole process all over again. Okay, status pages. Engineers love green bots, right? I know I certainly love it when the bots are green. It means I don't have to yell at anybody. Uh, and I know most engineers love it when the bots are green because it means no one's gonna come bother them. They can continue on with their day. Uh, this is our smiley face builder page. It was developed uh, internally by one of our colleagues. Um, each column represents a commit. Uh, each row represents a specific test run. It's a pretty dense layout, but uh, it's nice because our engineers can very quickly go in and find their commit. They can run down the column real fast, make sure that they're passing all the tests that they need to pass, and they can go on with their day. Or obviously, if something's read, they can deal with the problem quickly um, and then go back to doing what they need to do. Another internal tool that we've developed uh, is our merge pane tracker. Um, so we use this to help keep track of all of the merge conflicts that occur uh, during the periods of time when we're in between merging our open source branch to our staging branch. You'll remember I said sometimes there's a lot of manual intervention that has to occur there. Um, so we needed a way to keep track of the merge conflicts that were occurring. And the reason we do that is to help us really surface the code which requires the most human attention um, on our part. And that allows us to really focus on getting that code and getting it upstreamed so that it can stop causing us merge conflicts altogether. Over time, we really hope that this tool will uh, finally be able to help, help us realize a, a real healthy reduction in the amount of time that it takes to resolve merge conflicts or even have to deal with them altogether. Okay, so we have some tools, we have some process. Why don't we just automate everything, right? I mean, it's really easy. You just turn it on, turn the dial up, let things go. Well, it's not exactly that easy. See, the trick with automation is that you can't allow an automated process to outpace your human's ability to keep up with it. Uh, a classic example of this that I love talking about is there was an old I Love Lucy episode, the one where Lucy and Ethel are in the chocolate factory and the conveyor belt gets going, yeah, everybody's starting to remember. Anyway, what happens? The conveyor belt goes crazy, right? And they lose the ability to be able to actually do their job, which was pick the, pack, pick the chocolate and pack it right back in a box, right? So, Whenever we do things with automation, we always, I, at least I always keep that in mind, uh, that, that show in mind, because I, I want to avoid doing anything that's going to cause us a similar situation. A, a good example of this would be, if I were to have just shown up on day one, turned on automation, turned the dial to 11, and let things roll, uh, we would have ended up with so many merge conflicts and such a messed up source tree that the first thing Paul would have done was just push me out of the boat and let me fend for myself. Um, bots would have turned red. Ultimately, engineers end up with a flood of you know, failure notifications. And what happens? Everybody just loses interest in it, right? It, it, it stops being a useful tool, and it's just noise, and nobody wants to deal with it anymore. So the moral of the story is, uh, when you can, invest in automation. Automate as much as you can. But always make sure that whatever you automate, your humans are able to keep up with that process as well. Okay, so that was a little bit about us. It's what we do, it's how we got here. And so now it's your turn. This is where we like to turn it over to you, our studio audience, to see how it is that you guys deal with things like merge pane. How do you deal with private branches? How do you deal with automation? Do you even use automation? Who's first? So you say you test every single commit that you do internally. Is that after the commit has been done to your development branch or before? Uh, so private branches, we build and test those as well. And then obviously anything coming in from open source, we build and test. Right. Okay. And when we merge, we build and test the merge as well. Because what we considered was um, 
every commit that's done by our developers goes onto a test branch, which is automatically built and tested. And if that passes, it's automatically merged as well. So for commits that we make ourselves, um, the developer is responsible for building, running the Clang and LVM regressions, and also um, at least one iteration of the test suite that we have found is most likely to break. Uh, after that, they can commit to our master branch and we'll let the automation figure out what else is going to break. Um, it's yeah, worked out pretty well. Thanks. So how much testing do you do in each phase? Is it just lit or do you have a certain other extra criteria? And do you build on Linux and Windows or? We build on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, and that, all that takes 25 minutes? Yes. OK. Um, ah, sorry. Linux and Mac, for sure, fall into the 25-minute window. Right. Um, Windows, all the way through phase three, we get done under 25 minutes. Phase four, because it's debug asserts and it's all the targets, that itself runs about 30 minutes. But again, we, we sort of do phase four um, just as a means of coverage. Phase four breaking isn't the end of the world for us. Phase one through three, it's definitely like I have to get on it right away and find out you know, what broke and get in touch with somebody. So those all fall in the, in the under the 25 minutes, but phase four breaks all. So that, that's, the, that's the build, basically, and then uh, this process is, is a whole ream of test suites, some of which are done every commit, some of which are run daily, some of which are run weekly. Um, the per check-in testing, a couple hours probably. But it's, internally it's a relatively small team and we don't usually see more than one, maybe two commits per day uh, from within our team. Oh, I'm talking about the upstream commits. Yeah, okay, so. well fine. So you, you test each one of those at some level and you say this is good, yeah. right? Each one, each one of those phases runs the uh, LLVM and Clang lit tests. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so, so LLVM and so is that That's tests. the bar you use to progress it to the next stage? Yes. Okay. And then at some point you run your full sweat, sweat? Maybe there are sweaty tests, <laughs> I don't know. But your full suite of, reg of regression tests. So, so then periodically we will take the staging branch and merge it into master and treat it like a developer commit and it will go through this additional suite of tests. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm really curious to know what uh, source control management tool you used for your you know, nightmare of a merge that took three months. Uh, I don't think that the source control system had anything to do with it taking three months. Uh, at that point we were using SVN it was a straight you know, dupe of upstream. It was uh, a, uh, it's a typical vendor branch merge kind of situation. Well, the reason I ask is twofold. One is uh, because you know, we uh, have an internal project where we track some open source projects and uh, the merges that I've handled, um, I've, you know, I've failed to synchronize for years sometimes. And, uh, and the tool we use actually does a pretty good job of uh, auto merging. Uh, and your situation sort of reminds me of the lieutenants of the Linux kernel that were having all sorts of problems merging. And I know that subversion is really bad at merging. So uh, my sense is uh, if you had better tools, it probably would have been a lot easier to do those merges. And it might still be the case. Yes. <laughs> You should um, talk to them. Bo bo both SVN and Git, in, in my understanding, um, basically, if there are competing edits to the same line, it's a conflict and the human has to figure it out. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. So, um, wow, that's loud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we actually have a setup very, very similar to what you're doing um, for the local changes we make at Microsoft. Um, we test on a nightly granularity for upstream. So every night we attempt to merge 
lvm.org into our own private branch that includes the few local changes. We don't have anything on the scale of what you guys have at Sony. Um, and then build and run the tests. How have you found the per commit granularity? Like, do you, do you think that being able to test lvm.org at a per commit granularity really provides much advantage compared to a slower cadence? So it seems like a lot of machine time. So uh, if we can, I'm going to split this into two answers. Sure, I'll, sure. I'll talk about the open source stuff. I'm going to let talk, Paul talk about the internal side of it. For me, being able to do, uh, being able to have the infrastructure available to do that level of granularity, I think is really useful because it allows me the ability to feed information back to the community very, very quickly. Right. Um, so if something breaks. You know, it's real simple to jump on IRC. Uh, as a matter of fact, I seem to be getting a little bit of a reputation on IRC now that when people see me log in, if there's a broken build already, someone will jump in and be like, yeah, yeah, shut up, I know, I know, leave me alone, right? I'm fixing it. Um, and and so, so I love that, and, and I have the ability to do it, so, so we do it. Um, on the internal side, obviously, you know, if we have the hardware, we're able to, to test every commit, we go for it. Um, I think if we get to a point where we can't, we, we would change things, but Paul will say better. Um, one, th one thing that we have run into is if we're doing a big lump of merges, of, of upstream changes all at once, um, it, it nearly always causes something to break in our internal testing, um, but figuring out where the breakage came from is much trickier because the upstream stuff sure. came in all in one lump. And if we are pulling things in individually so that we can linearize that history, even if it's intermixed with our own local history, we can still do a better job of bisecting uh, where the problem came from. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, I wanted to underscore the get things upstream as soon as you possibly can as a, as a serious best practice. Um, that's one of the things we've been trying to do and have been relatively successful with here and there. And it is absolutely the single most important thing you can do to minimize your merge pain because you don't have any at that point, right? Yeah. Well, so anyhow. If it's already upstream, then there is no merge pain. Exactly, right? You, you have no merge pain at that point. When aside it from, comes in, it's all, somebody yeah. else has dealt with the. Yes. Anyhow. Who's next? In the back. How do you decide uh, when to merge down from your staging branch to your master branch? Is that done based on, uh, you know, human looking at some of your dashboards, or is that done every so often, or what? Uh, so the staging branch needs to be uh, clean as far as the check-in test is concerned. And we currently are doing it, well, the, <laughs> the current goal is to do it weekly. Um, we're actually making it happen usually between every two to four weeks. Um, but we're continuing to pull things into the staging branch <coughs> so we can have some idea what's going on. Um, because the staging branch is set up to run the check-in tests, um, we know that when we pull it into the master branch, because we keep the staging branch up to date with our check-ins to master, we know that it's going to pass the CI tests right away. And then it's just, you know, what, what, what's the, what else, what are the more detailed tests are going to show, um, which, you know, take longer to run, but break less frequently, which is kind of the balance point that we make between how often do we run a particular test. So then when you decide to uh, merge down from your staging branch to your master, is that the point at which you run all of your extensive tests before committing to the master? Uh, no, no. The staging branch is set up to do the same check-in testing that the master branch has. Okay. okay. But there's a, there's a separate smiley face page for the staging branch. Thank you. 
Uh, there was somebody over here, and then we'll do you. Hey, I'm from AMD, and uh, we have a similar setup, uh, uh, and we do the sync uh, daily, and we do the testing. So as part of testing, we do the performance test. So if something breaks, if some regression appears in the performance test, so we sometimes find it's very difficult to triage which check-in made this uh, performance regression. So what do you do for it? Are you running performance testing? Uh, we, we, yeah. <clears throat> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every so often we, we say, yeah, we should, we should have, like, performance. <laughs> we have, yeah. Oh, so, in, in fact, we do, Greg tells me, we do collect this data, and we, and we put it off in the database over there, and <laughs> it's there. We could look at it. We, we don't. <laughs> Okay, so on the, the tests that we're running on every local commit that we make, and therefore also every time we pull into the staging branch, that kind of includes a bunch of benchmarks which we're running on PS4 dev kits and also uh, like a few PS4 game kind of things. Um, and for most of those, we do record performance, performance data. Um, but we're currently not in the habit of checking that as kind of a, you know, as part of the decision on whether to push the merge to our master branch or not. Um, but the data is there for when we then do generally kind of in the run up to a release, we'll have a look at the history. And at that point, we can normally kind of bisect to where the performance problem happened. Um, it's not ideal because often that might be months later. So really, yeah, we want to be spotting that stuff as soon as, as soon as the issue happens. So that's something we need to improve in future. Sorry, it was. Over. Can you guys pass it back, please? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, with your current automation, how far are you from the current upstream? What we are, well, as I said, we're, we're trying to uh, pull from upstream into master branch. Our goal is weekly, and what we're actually managing is every two to four. So we're, we're not more than a month behind at this point. Okay. Does your automation track the conflicts? Because you might be solving the same conflict again and again. Uh, that, uh, Mike has built this, the merge pane tracker. And so whenever, every, every time, right, every, every commit from upstream comes in, we do a trial merge into the staging branch, and if there's a conflict, it logs a ticket in the uh, JIRA ticket, and we can have that historical data to look at. Um, the, the idea is that um, we can look at the history of those trackers and decide what's causing us the most grief and see if we can prioritize pushing those changes upstream sooner. So, so the idea is that, that it'll happen we're getting one, roughly one new one per day, something like that, uh, give, give or take. On average, yeah. Yeah, a new one every day. Uh, so, you know, so we'll have a couple dozen to fix every every two weeks. And we've actually taken uh, some pretty good steps to to build some deduplication into uh, our, you know, um, our bot that files the ticket, the JIRA ticket for us, so that we don't get a single ticket. Yeah, if it's the same conflict that's coming through every single time, it's not like we generate a gajillion tickets that are all the same exact conflict. We, we dedupe those, um, and we just try to keep comments on how often it happens, because that gives us a bit of a gauge as to you know, what's actually causing us the most, most pain. Uh, can you go to the slide uh, which shows the stage? Uh, sure. This one? Uh, no, the one which, which has LVM arg. Error. Oh, sorry. Yes. So from open source to staging, is it 
a cherry pick are a bunch of batches as a merge. Uh, that, that's done as a merge. Uh, what if you have a, uh, let's say you have a failure, your bots detected a failure. So at that point, so how many comments you bunch together for a merge? Uh, what is the criteria for that? Uh. Right, so uh, this, this, ugh, this one to here. Uh, that, that's the one where we see roughly one new one per day. Um, in practice, you know, the automation is currently only doing the trial merges. It's not doing for real merges. And, and the human comes along and does the real merge and fixes all of the conflicts. That we, we batch it up because the pace that we're getting them is more than we can really devote people to time to fixing continually. And so we batch those up and we're doing it every, every week or two. Um, okay. Does that answer the question? Yes. Uh, Close enough. Uh, I have another question. One more. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys internally use any bisection to try to triage any bugs? Because I see history is not linear on your master because you're merging from open source and then again you're cherry picking and then again remerging it. Uh. Yes, currently it is a merge and that is a problem. We want it to be a linear history on the, the master branch. Um, we'll, have we figured out how to do that yet? No. Not, not in the group. No. We, we don't have a good, good answer for that one. Um, okay. we're, we're, if we can get to the point of uh, being able to do this continually and do this one, like daily, that will help a lot. Okay. And and the cherry picking, the, the coming up, that that can happen. That can be automated pretty easily. Okay. Uh, there's somebody who's been waiting over here. Oh. Uh, thanks. Uh, I didn't understand your uh, argument about uh, why adding a, a local comment here comment because if you do a, at least a, 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 a three or more way merge, you would see what the local changes are and not not a diff between the, the end versions of that. Okay, so during the bulk merge, which is, you know, if we're doing it once per release, then we're doing the four-way merge and we're trying to do it all at once and we have the full context in that situation, yes. Um, what the local change made here lets me do is look at an individual merge, uh, you know, a little merge. <laughs> um, look at the look at the conflict report from SVN or Git, and it shows me the diff, right? And it has the tag right there, and I know how to fix the problem, the the merge conflict, the physical merge conflict, right away. Okay. okay, so you so usually as, as opposed to a conflict coming in and the diff being there and and there's there's no hint what's going on and there's like okay somebody made a mistake. Right. So 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 it's it helps you to to avoid uh, starting up a, a three or four way merge tool then. That's the idea. Uh, as as we do things more frequently, then we don't need to do the four way merge so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it, it's not clear to me what kind of cherry pick you're doing from master to staging. Are all commits cherry picked? Or I'm sorry? What are the criteria to cherry pick from? How do we choose what we cherry pick from master? Yeah. Ah, so um, any changes that we make locally go into master, and they are cherry picked into the staging branch. So you're cherry picking, cherry picking everything. Right? Yes. Every, everything that we do internally. Yeah. Yeah. So just not clear why you're doing that. Like, that sounds crazy to me, but there, um, there might be a good reason. We want to keep the staging branch 
current with the master branch. Right? Yes. So, so anytime somebody commits to master, it immediately propagates into staging. And this you allows just us want to, to avoid these two, this because you could merge as well. Uh, we could merge. Um, my not very deep understanding of Git is that if you are doing merges between branches in two directions, that can be not so great. So what we do is we cherry pick into the staging branch and then merge back down to master so that the merging is all going down in this picture. And is the cherry picking process automated or do you do it manually? Uh, it, it, <laughs> so it is scripted, although it is not yet automated. Um, and so uh, that, this is currently a manual process, but, um, but my, my trainee <laughs> is, uh, is very prompt about that sort of thing. And, and in fact, there's really no reason we couldn't automate it. We just haven't gotten to that yet. OK. Um, another comment is uh, someone asked about bisection. And uh, so you're merging on a regular basis, but you're merging multiple commits at a time. And so then later on, if you need to bisect the origin of a failure, this is where you get a problem, especially if there are merge conflicts. Yes. Um, a way that I've found efficient to solve it, which is not nice with the history, is to merge one commit at a time, uh, which means even if you merge once a week, you can decide to merge one commit after the other, and then you get a sequence of... Yes, we could do that. Mer we could um, look at the... Uh, what, am I, what am I trying to say? We can look at the history of what is about to be merged and do, pull them one at a time. Yes, we could we could do that. Yeah, I um, yeah I I implemented a script this, that this is a part of the automation on merge conflict to yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, it, um, internally, on a more complicated <laughs> process, we did it for merge conflicts. Like if you get um, so. We gated the merge from open source to our internal branch on the success of the CI. So the problem is that if open source breaks our internal branch for any reason, um, we, may, we might not merge for a few days. And then you get a lot of commits. And if you have merge conflicts that can come from multiple commits and it can be hard to fix. And um, so in this case, it's easy to try to merge only the commits that pass the CI, you know, so then you can try to bisect before merging and merging only what succeed and then you get only one commit that provoke the merge conflicts um, and you merge this one and then the CI can test the rest and it helps uh, so. Uh, if, if you have great faith in your CI testing and other things break extremely rarely, that works great. Um, our experience is that some of the tests that we run nightly or weekly will catch things and we will want to bisect within that range. So, yeah, we, we, our, our goal is to get things done individually uh, in the long run so that we can have a, an essentially linear history. Uh, okay, I'm just going to say real quick, it's um, I think 6 o'clock at this point uh, and I know everybody's anxious to go get uh, a cocktail and dinner. I know I am, um, but I, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit. I know, I know Paul is. Um, so if you want to stay and keep asking questions, we're, we're happy to stick around for a little bit. Um, but if you do want to move on to the next uh, thing, please uh, feel free. Thank you. So.